Um. <coughs> PS5 Pro substantially improves over PlayStation 5 in three ways. Here's what we call the big three. It feels less like a big three and more like a moderate trio. To see the difference? Okay, yeah, so so the hedgerows are clearer. You want better hedgerows? I do. $800, please. PS5 Pro is much sharper and crisper than PS5. Where? Are we looking at the same thing? Like, I don't even know what I'm supposed to be focusing on here because they are identical. I mean, I've been saying it time and time again, but this is the absolute defining era of diminishing returns. I don't know, maybe I'm crazy. Is somebody gonna, is somebody really gonna drop $700 for this? So this Wi-Fi router with racing stripes on it has a big thing. Well, Sony actually says it has three big things. An upgraded GPU, advanced ray tracing. I've seen that people are saying that the upgraded GPU and the ray tracing, those are the same things. Two of them are the same thing. Larger GPU and advanced ray tracing. Ray tracing is all handled within the GPU. So two of your three things are basically the same thing. But technically, yes, you can have an upgraded and bigger GPU and the ray tracing could actually not improve at the same rate. So what they did here was actually exponentially improve the rate that ray tracing is upgraded here. And the third thing is, PlayStation Spectral Super Resolution, aka Pisser. I think it's kind of interesting that there's this AI thing that's coming onto the console. We've actually had DLSS AI upscaling on PC since literally 2018, and it was much improved in 2020. These are the three big things that Sony is claiming is separating the PS5 Pro from the normal PS5. The PS5 Pro is a wake up call that you can't just sell a console on graphics. Like, let's look at these side-by-sides that PlayStation themselves showed us in their marketing. I know, it looks like a huge difference, especially if you're watching on a phone. I bet you can see all the differences here. Actually, with these side-by-sides, let's play a little bit of a game and see if you can guess which one is on the PS5 Pro. So go ahead and count your score. We're gonna have five slides of this. Okay, a nice easy one to start out here. This is Last of Us Part Two, And in the demo, they actually had the amateur version of the PS5 running at 30 FPS, which means that the amateur one actually had more motion blur in the footage. So it should be pretty obvious to see the detail here. And if you don't see it, then you're just blind according to Sony. So in three, two, one. The right side was the pro version. The left side was the amateur. All right, let's move on. Spider-Man 2, a little bit more of a complex scene here, but let's go ahead and zoom into this truck over here and see if you can make out a little bit of detail on all of that. I'm gonna make you decide in three, two, one. The left side was the pro version. And if you're on the right side, well, I guess you're just an amateur PS5 owner. So let's see if we can even actually tell a difference here. I'm just gonna go ahead and zoom in on these vines or whatever the heck this is. Can you make it out? Okay, I'm gonna reveal it in three, two, one. The pro version was on the left. Did you get it? Oh, man, I just, I love the way Ratchet and Clank looks, quote, Mark Cerny. My favorite is the parade scene from Ratchet and Clank. Back to Spider-Man 2, because we only really have three games here that they demoed in their technical presentation. I'm gonna zoom in. I, I bet you can tell a huge difference between these right now. Okay, I'm gonna reveal it in three, two, one. The right side was the pro version. Did you get it? We're just kind of looking over this watchtower here. And let's zoom in and see if we can make out some more detail on the pro version. I know you can tell a huge difference. It is just night and day here, obviously. So I'm gonna reveal it in three, two, one. The pro version was on the left. Actually, I'm gonna throw in a bonus one. Let's go back to Last of Us Part Two in motion here. So again, should be a huge difference in sharpness. I'm gonna reveal it in three, two, one. The right side was the professional PS5. I know, huge difference, and everyone can definitely tell what's going on here. And the reason I made it six is so that we have an even number of tests. And that means if you scored a 50% here, it's a 50-50, you know, you're basically guessing at that point. You might as well just schedule your doctor's appointment to get some glasses because you failed, buddy. Sony tells you you failed. You should be able to see the difference, obviously. Most of these things really aren't that tangible to most people, except for one thing, and that is the frame rate. I think the big thing with the new PlayStation is the fact that it's 120 FPS. 
That's the good selling point. If I've gathered anything about the reactions to the PS5 Pro, it's that going from 30 FPS consistently to possibly 60 FPS almost all the time on the PS5 Pro is a massive thing. And frame rate is honestly, for me, the most important thing. I don't give a f if it's at 2160 over 1080, I want 60 frames per second. And just seeing that three quarters of people were already picking in the performance mode to try to hit 60 FPS in games, I think is really telling to how important frame rate is to a game. I think this is a huge wake up call to see what is really important with games. It isn't how they look or anything like that because a lot of people can't really tell the difference with how the PS5 Pro looks here, but it's how the games feel that matters. And with the PS5 Pro, the real problem is, where are the games? It's hilarious that the showcase of the PS5 Pro capabilities, like it started with a PS4 game, and then it just further cemented the idea that PS5 has no games. And the rest of the demo, Horizon Forbidden West was on PS4, same with Last of Us Part Two. Gran Turismo 7 was on PS4, Hogwarts Legacy, was also on PS4, and the only true PS5 exclusive games were actually Ratchet and Clank Rift Apart and Spider-Man 2. There's just no way that these two games were the only ones that are gonna sell people to get a PS5 Pro or even let alone upgrade to a PS5 in general. And let's just like take a quick look at their the Wikipedia page here. This just blows me away. PlayStation 5 only games. What do we have here? Are there any big titles that really stand out to anybody? Well, Astrobot came out recently, which I think has been pretty well received. It's It looks pretty fun to me. Death Stranding 2 is not out yet. Demon Souls, the remaster, came out in 2020, but this is a remaster of a game. Although this game looked beautiful, and from what I can tell, they added like quality of life improvements and stuff, but I, it's still a, an old game. Final Fantasy VII Rebirth, so that's one game, I guess. I don't know what Firewall Ultra is, so okay. Horizon Call of the Mountain is a VR game, so that isn't really applicable to most people. Last of Us Part Two Remastered is a remaster, so you might as well just... uh. It's also a PS4 game. Marvel's Wolverine is not out yet. I don't know what Neptuna is. Project Wingman, Quantum Error, are, what, what are these games? Now, Spider-Man 2 is an exclusive game that matters. Deller Blade is also a game. So we've got mainly like three titles that are out right now, I guess that aren't <laughs> um, remasters or remakes that are actually exclusive to PS5 and you can't just play on the PS4. I think that's just a huge thing to showing how important the games are to sell a console. Why do you make a PS5 Pro with all of this graphical capability? This is quote unquote holding back devs when there's no games that are really unique to this new console that actually take advantage of this new hardware. The only good thing here is the 60 FPS from what we can really tell. And then when you go in, you account for the price. Freaking $700 plus you still need to get a disk drive. Insane. And if you want your console to stand up with a vertical stand, they don't include this little plastic thing in the box for a $700 console. You have to pay an extra 30 bucks on top of that. And you're talking like an $800 PS5 Pro. The disk drive, that's like one of the big things about console. You can like share games with each other with physical copies and everything. And if you take away the disk drive for the console, you don't get that. Like on a $700 device, there's no way that they weren't able to fit in a disk drive to the budget like you can kind of understand on the cheaper version of the ps5 to have a digital only version and then one with a disk drive on it this seems like an opportunity where sony is trying to discourage people from getting physical media they're trying to kill off physical media for games so they can own you in their ecosystem so not only are you paying extra for this pro device you can't get games used you can't share games you have to buy things from sony's store on their device they can revoke that license from you basically whenever they want you don't actually own your games if you buy it only from a digital store not only that but because of how distribution online is set up sony can price whatever they want for the games that takes away power from the consumers and then gives it to Sony, which doesn't surprise me. I mean, Sony company, Sony do big company things. They're going to try to take as much power away from us as they possibly can. Sony needs to pay for Concord one way or another. Plus when there's no new games for the PS5 Pro to take advantage of the hardware, it's like, why, why even get this console like this? 
In fact, when you start to look at $700 or $800, if you actually want to get a disk drive for your console, you know what pricing that actually starts to get towards? A PC. I know that's something that probably scares a lot of console players away. It's like, oh, PCs are so expensive and everything. But when you really break it down, if you want to go to a pro model of a PS5, it is not that far away from a very solid gaming PC that could probably perform very similar to what a PS5 Pro can. Plus, you get all the advantages of going to PC. I think it really starts to come into question what the pros and cons of a device like that are Anyways, so let's actually look at it. I made a little list here for you, okay? Because obviously I'm a PC gamer. I mean, I have been, it's been, I'm gonna go full cam again. I've been gaming since I was a little kid. The best thing I ever did was decide to make my own custom PC. Because not only did a custom PC, I mean, you don't have to go custom. You could have somebody build it for you or something like that. If you're not that technically inclined. Not only was it a really fun project to me, I saved up for my first PC, but also I got a PC which was faster than the consoles at the time. I actually didn't even cost that much for me. I built it when I was like 16. But now I'm still just iterating on my system. I still am using, you know, remnants of what I had all that time ago when I built my first PC. It's not like it ever leaves you. You can keep upgrading this. You can use your PC for more than just playing games. I've started my YouTube channel on my PC by editing and recording videos, doing all kinds of stuff that you realistically just can't really do on a PS5 or something like that. So not only does a PC give you a lot of flexibility, but now it's getting the same exclusives that consoles do anyways. And in a lot of times you can get better quality in the games than you would on a PS5 as well. But let's look at it, like, let's be, let's be fair here because obviously I'm biased with PC. But let's look at what it would be an advantage to get the PS5. The exclusive games on consoles used to be a much bigger advantage from what I can tell. Although it is a pro on PS5, it can be even damaging to the gaming community as a whole because you know you have to buy a PS5 to get these games and access to them. This point is starting to wane in how important it really is. Now, a huge advantage that the PS5 can have is the cheap upfront cost. Now, this doesn't really apply to the PS5 Pro. I mean, I think aptly named Sony has probably called it the PS5 Pro because this is actually probably one of the first devices that I've seen come out from any company that is called a Pro device and genuinely is for like professional because not everybody should be buying the PS5 Pro. It doesn't seem worth it. The, the, the benefits are kind of negligible for most people. You can play all of the games on PS5 amateur edition anyways. It does have a cheaper upfront cost because if you do look at the PS5, it's like $500 or $400 for the discless version of it. So it's not that bad. They made a slim version. I don't know how much the slim version actually costs. Overall, it is cheaper upfront cost to get a console or a PS5 in general. Another huge advantage of the PS5 is the simplicity of the setup in the convenience. It is so easy to just plug in a PS5. I think you need to sign into a place in a network account, set up your Wi-Fi password, and then you just basically can start playing games. There's really nothing else to it. Simplicity as well, it does make it great for kids. So if you wanna get a present for kids and stuff, PlayStation or any console really is probably a better way to go. Another great thing with PS5 is you can use physical media. They're clearly trying to persuade people to not be using physical media anymore. Also, there's just a natural community because consoles themselves are just very accessible. They don't cost as much. They're easier to set up. There's just a more natural community surrounding consoles in general. Basically the pros for the PS5. Now you have any more pros for the PS5 or the pro, pro the pros for the pro, then uh, leave them in the comments below. But this is basically all I could think of. Now with the cons for PS5, these ones are rough. Because the big one, at least to me, is the restrictive ecosystem of the PlayStation environment and Sony ecosystem and all that kind of stuff. And that comes to a bunch of different things, like it manifests in different ways, like in the controllers. You are stuck using Sony product controllers or at least off-brand controllers of the same thing, but you basically have to use at least that input device that works with the PlayStation. Like using a controller in a first-person shooter, it just isn't built for that, and it kind of sucks to play games like that. On other things, games are locked down. If you go to another generation of console, you can't even guarantee that the new generation is going to be backwards compatible with your old games imagine buying all these games and then you have to say you have to sell your old console to get a ps5 or something like that what if your old games don't work on the new one and then they're basically 
just worthless. Or if you have to buy games specifically on Sony's store or whatever the heck Sony's store is called, which just means that Sony can price fix things. They might not do sales. They might not put things on the store that you would want to buy. Maybe something that gets discontinued. Maybe they shut down the store and its servers in general and you can't update your games and all of that. This is a huge problem with games being locked down. Also downside, you basically can't mod games on here. I know consoles are more or less built for a pretty simple type of gamer that isn't as hardcore and stuff. You're going to be called a hacker at that point and probably get banned. Not only does Sony have to lock down all the games, but they also lock down all the apps. So you can only get Sony approved apps on a PlayStation 5, for example. Discord, I mean, that's the thing. I think that only just started. Did Discord get on PlayStation now? Yeah, I think this only just recently got added that you can use Discord on a PlayStation 5 now, which is pretty huge. I mean, on PC here, we basically always use Discord, but it took a while to get onto the consoles. So that stuff can just happen on console and you can't really do anything about it as a gamer. And then you also might get apps that don't get updated and stuff if the console, it's just a messy situation. These are parts of the restrictive ecosystem that is on Sony PS5. It just really sucks. And that's because you're getting a device made by one company here. Then other than that, you got to pay for online. What is it like 60 bucks a year? Is there more than that now? I don't know if prices have gone up. I, you can see the last time I played console. I, I have no clue if it's gone up, but paying for online sucks. Also, no upgradeability unless you count a disk drive. Basically, all the upgrade ability you can go into like a PlayStation 5. So I'm pretty sure you can upgrade the storage in it. PS5 Pro does actually come with a two terabyte SSD now, whereas the old one came with a one terabyte or a 512 gigabyte. That's it. Like once your PS5 is out of date, there's no way you're going to keep it in date. Like you can't upgrade like the GPU or something yourself. It just doesn't work like that. When it's done, it's done. Basically e-waste, unless you somehow figure out a use for it or want to bust it out of the dusty old closet every once in a while. And just for the memes too, you got to pay $30 just to stand this thing up. What? Now let's go ahead and look at the pros and cons of PC gaming. Ooh, so many people have been so scared about this. We discussed it with the exclusives that PlayStation is bringing to PC anyways, because Sony want to make more money. Every game is pretty much available on PC, at least in one way or another. Like Steam or just PC in general has extremely good backwards compatibility. You can play PC games that came out in 2008 or something like that. Right now, it'll probably just work on your hardware. It's amazing how that stuff can work. There's also emulation. I'm not going to say how you're going to get your ROMs, but you can just emulate different consoles all the time. There's some crazy PlayStation 3 emulators or even PlayStation 4 emulators that have actually come out. Also, modding, something that the PlayStation 5 just does not really have. Some of the greatest games of all time have actually come from mods. For example, Dota 2. DayZ was a mod. H1Z1, I'm pretty sure it was a mod. PUBG, I think was a mod of H1Z1. League of Legends was a mod. Maybe this one could be X'd out because maybe that game should have never existed in the first place. That's how strong the modding community is. It can literally make new games within it. it really isn't as hard or as complicated as a lot of people might like to make it out to be. Like for example here, uh, let me actually just see it. Like see, I have a mod launcher here on my computer called R2 Modman. Here's all the games that this launcher supports on its own. So you can just kind of pick a game. And just for example here, I like to play Risk of Rain 2. You just select the game and you play, oh, I play it on Steam. Don't use Epic Games Store, it kind of sucks. And then you can just kind of see all of your mods in here. So I just go here and these are all the mods that I have. I got to update them, just press update. Boom, it just kind of does it for you. People have made modding tools super easy. Oh, I don't want this mod or something. And you just press that one. This is a really great modding tool and as complicated as maybe people want to make modding seem, modding is actually pretty easy nowadays. It depends on the game, obviously, uh, and what kind of community is built up for it and how passionate people are for it because more people will work on it the more passionate they are. It's pretty cool modding community. Not Maybe not the average gamer would get into it, but definitely a cool aspect of PC gaming that you just have access to. You have the freedom to do it if you want to. Something about like the Sony PlayStation Store or whatever, that store can be very expensive and Sony can pick when things go on sale. Whereas with Steam or something like that, let, let's just go to Steam itself. As you can see here, there actually, funnily enough, is a PlayStation publisher sale going on right now. <laughs> Seeing all the PlayStation games we get here.
Helldivers 2, all of a sudden is just 20% off on PC here. Uh, Ghost of Tsushima, which didn't even come out that long ago on PC. I know it came out a long time ago on PlayStation, but this is already going for 20% off. Uh, you can get Horizon Forbidden West. Horizon Zero Dawn for $12.50. And this is just one of the sales. Sales go on all the time on Steam. Really cool about Steam is it's less of a curated experience from a company like Sony. Steam is more of a marketplace of a bunch of different developers coming through. And basically the games that are the most popular and that are trending and stuff will come up to the front of the Steam page. And that's where you start to see things. It's like a very natural ecosystem. It does actually lead to the developers individually putting their games on sale so that means you can get some pretty nice prices whereas compared to playstation store or something like that it just might not be epic game store has to compete with steam so ends up being that epic also usually has pretty good sales as well another huge aspect about pc gaming is the upgradable system you can pick and choose what you actually value inside your pc say like get into pc gaming obviously you play a lot of games maybe you want to go up to more graphically demanding games you can upgrade your graphics card what if you actually want to do more like productivity type stuff? You play games on the PC, but you actually do a lot of work on it as well. Well, you can actually prioritize your CPU upgrade if you want to. Not to say that CPUs are important for gaming too, but you can pick whatever path you really want on PC to get the most value out of your system possible. And that's what's so beautiful about it is just how free PC gaming is, which does come with some downsides, which we'll talk about in a little bit. But overall, that is a really nice upside. <laughs> I just put AMD. <laughs> Let's just uh, consoles have AMD as well. The PC master race. If you're on PC, then you can join the master race and it comes with a free pass to the PC master race Reddit which is probably home to the best people on this planet. Mm, love that place, it's so great. Now back onto the, the less serious stuff here. You get an everlasting library of games on PC. If you just want an example here, let's just look at my Steam page personally. These are just my favorited games on Steam. And you can probably see games in here that would have spanned multiple generations of consoles. I'm able to play all of these games on PC itself. That doesn't even, that isn't even every game I own. If you scroll on the left side here, you can see just even more games that I have access to that I don't even <laughs> always play. You can have an insane library of Steam and the reason why my library is so big and, and the reason I don't have all these games installed by the way is because I don't have my game drive in my PC. But you can carry this library of games with you throughout the times that you upgrade your computer, which is so powerful and something that consoles can't really claim for themselves. I mean, you might lose your whole library of games when you move to a new generation of consoles, but your Steam library follows with you. Your Epic Games library follows with you because PCs fundamentally work the same and all of these games can work on the hardware. One downside that we'll talk about in just a second, but mostly this is pretty huge upside. So another pro that kind of tacks on to the everlasting library of games is actually having the privilege of being under the absolute presence of Lord Gaben. Another huge thing is you can use any input device. So like in my case here, I got a keyboard and a mouse and I'm just kind of on my computer. You guys have probably used a keyboard and a mouse before, but also whenever I play games on a computer, I can go out there, I can get my Xbox controller. You can actually use a PlayStation controller. You can use a Nintendo Switch controller, which I don't have here, but you can, you can use it on PC. But I will say when it comes down to it at the end of the day, keyboard and mouse, it's kind of the best. I mean, if you want to play a first person shooter, anything where you have a camera in the game or you need to aim at all, keyboard and mouse is just like the superior way to play that game. There is no ifs, ands, or buts about it. Now it is a little bit harder to play with friends like locally couch co-op with keyboard and mouse. It doesn't really work like that. But if you're solo playing a game, keyboard and mouse is just absolutely the way to go. It's clearly the best. And another thing to tack on relating to like, oh, you can upgrade your computer as you want is you can actually customize your PC like you want as well. You can like put different fans in it. You can choose your case. You can choose what your motherboard looks like, your graphics card, what every, what every single component of your PC looks like. You can just decide that for yourself. Obviously, if you wanna put more shit in your computer, it's probably gonna cost more, but a lot of people like to customize what they use every day, and that's pretty fun. You go as far as like custom water cooling and everything. You can do whatever you want with a PC, and there is resources out, for, out there for you to actually make that work. You can do as much as you want with a PC, 
where you can actually do as little as you want with a PC to customize it. Kind of like how I am. I like just do not customize my PC whatsoever. I really don't care. It just kind of sits underneath my desk and it just works. And that means you can save some money on your PC if you don't do that much crazy stuff to it. You get Xbox games day one because it's Microsoft. I mean, I don't really know. I don't know why you want Starfield day one, but you can get it on PC and you have access to Microsoft Game Pass as well. You also get PlayStation exclusives now because Sony has caved and they want to cash out on PC as well. They found out that it's worth it. They, they have made a lot of money doing PC ports now. And frankly, I'm fine with it because I enjoy that quite a bit being a PC gamer. And in regards to that, the Sony games, they're going to launch live service games on day one on cross platform on PlayStation as well as PC. So like Helldivers 2 or Concord, everybody's favorite game. That was a live service game. Single player games, what they have said will be about a year after they launch on PlayStation. That doesn't mean that PC gaming is perfect. Obviously nothing's perfect, but if you even see from my pros and cons list, there's a lot more pros on PC than there are cons. So let's take a look at the cons on PC to see how bad they really are apparently. And this is the one thing that most people are scared away by, especially if you're console or if you just even look at PC in general, is the upfront price of a gaming PC. And I don't really blame people because it can seem very daunting when you go out there and you want to get a PC and it looks like this. It's like, oh man, you gotta get this processor that's a 7950X 3D. Oh, that's $560. You need to get this CPU cooler for $300. This motherboard for $440. You get an eight terabyte SSD. You know, it's really cool. But that's $1,200. Holy shit. Graphics could get a 4090 for like $2,000. You get these fans. Each pack of these fans are $130. You have to get this OLED monitor for $1,300. <laughs> At the end of it, you're like, what the fuck? <laughs> this PC is $8,900, brother. <laughs> yeah, that's the thing about PC gaming. And what scares a lot of people off is they think that PCs cost like at least $2,000 plus. I, obviously, I went crazy with this. But that's what is kind of crazy about the freedom with PC gaming is that you can go as kind of cheap or as expensive as you possibly want and you can just go absolutely overkill. Hey, I'm in post here and I realized I yapped about these PCs for a really long time. I just wanted to give you the general idea. You can spend as little money as you want on it or as much money as you want. And you can go as low as an $800 PC that actually in some cases will probably outperform the PS5 Pro minus the graphics card in some cases. Or you can just kind of work up the ladder to improve certain parts that you want maybe even to a point where you can outperform the PS5 Pro in literally all situations while also having upgradability for the future of your build. And I have all kinds of videos about picking out the best parts. I'm going to link my graphics card buying guide, the latest one that I have up in the top right corner of the screen, if you want to check it out for yourself. The upfront price of PCs, regardless, is going to cost more than a console because Sony literally sells a PlayStation at a loss. So you can't really beat that on PC, but you can get pretty close to it with all the savings and free online sales and everything you take advantage of on PC as well. There's the other side is we kind of talked about all those components on the PC. And that adds to the complexity of PC gaming in general, that a lot of people probably won't be able to do the research and spec out their own computer for themselves. And I don't really blame. You might want to have somebody build a computer for you. If you don't really trust yourself, you can get pre built which will cost more. You know, you can do that if you do so, please. There's also the complexity of computers where it's like, oh, you might have to update drivers or something like that. And say on my main computer here, I actually have the NVIDIA app. See, actually, look, there is a driver update right now. You just have an app. You have to open this up and just kind of check it every now and then. Just make sure you don't, don't have new drivers. If a new game comes out, you probably want to update your drivers. I mean, you also got to update your motherboard drivers. You got to update your CPU chipset drivers or your Wi-Fi drivers and all that kind of stuff. There can be all these little things that start to add up on PC. It can make the experience a little bit more complex. Also, sometimes when you launch a game or something like on rare occasions, it might just not work properly. I've had issues like that in the past. 99% of the times I have no issues issues on PC. That is part of the cost on PC of having such a wide range of component and the freedom that you have. It means that things don't always run smoothly. It's also kind of fun to figure out the stuff. It's uh, maybe not for the more technically inclined people that want a more easy experience that a console can offer. It is not bad either. I wouldn't get scared of it. It's not like you're on Linux or something like that.
And this point here could be kind of flipped as a negative or a positive for PC. Is it as a hardcore community? There is casual communities on PC, but they're fewer and farther between because a lot of people that get into PC at least are more technically inclined and that kind of stuff. So you're going to end up with communities that are just taking games more seriously. That leads to sweats, like any competitive game. Like I used to play quite a bit of Overwatch. There's going to be a lot of sweaty people in Overwatch. Yeah, there's sweaty people on console, but they don't have a keyboard and mouse on console. So <laughs> pretty rough on PC sometimes. Some people on PC communities can be very culty and clicky and all of that kind of stuff when I, you know, can't, you can't enter into this community and all of that kind of crap on PC. Yeah, you can run into that. But there can also be a aspect of hardcore communities that can be really cool. Let's say, for example, like I play Risk of Rain 2 quite a bit. And obviously the modding community for games is a hardcore community. And I love playing Risk of Rain too, because there's just like a very in-depth community that knows a lot about the game, can share about it. Yes, this can come up on console as well, but it's way more common on PC to have kind of niche communities that really interact with each other and really love games and then the community themselves. Kind of take it as you will. Depends how toxic you are. <laughs> and then the last thing here that I'm actually, I didn't have on the list before, but I want to add it here. No physical media. This is a huge downside on PC in general. Steam is an absolutely lovely service. I love Steam. But at the same time, you can't buy discs for PC. Every game they own on PC is a licensed copy of the game. And that licensed digital copy can be taken away from you at any moment's notice whatsoever. This is definitely a huge downside on PC that not everybody really talks about. The only reason we don't really run into this issue is that Valve and Steam, the service that they provide is just so good and it seems pretty community focused that we've never really had to run into these major issues on PC. It seems like Valve actually does value us actually owning and licensing games on PC when we don't actually own them. So we haven't had to run into this issue, but we don't actually own the games so if something does happen on pc you can get completely screwed over on pc i love my everlasting library that's lasted so long and i've built up over time i have access to whenever i want however i want but they can always be taken away from me on pc and that is a major major downside now what's funny is about console is they're going towards the same way that pc is the whole like digital media type of thing and sony and xbox they're also trying to clearly with the ps5 pro especially for a 700 dollar console not giving you a disk drive is clearly trying to persuade people even on devices they pay a lot of money for that you're not allowed to own physical media this isn't always like a big deal i think digital media is a great way to play games because it's very convenient you got your whole library right there so this is the freaking pros and cons of pc gaming obviously a lot more pros than cons although some of these are just kind of memes like like this one could probably just leave pc does have some huge advantages it has been the best decision that i've ever made in in gaming ever in my life to switch to pc gaming like this has been the best value surprisingly even though it costs more up front this has been the best value for me in my experience with gaming than any console would have ever gave me and the fact that i think people are still buying consoles that you know other than like a convenience factor or something like that just surprises me when it comes down to it. What's super funny about the whole PS5 Pro situation is I think it's probably still gonna sell extremely well. It's just the console brainwash. There could be no games for it. All this negative reception about no games. I mean, people would probably be okay with a $700 Pro console if there was a game that was launching with it that wasn't supposed to be Concord, that actually was going to be interesting and take advantage of the hardware, to allowing it to do something new and innovative that we've never seen before. If that game existed on the PS5 Pro, the reception, everything would probably be really good. But nowadays with the PlayStation 5 Pro, if it's going to cost that much, you're going to spend that much on a console. You might as well just go to PC where you're going to get all of the games that are on PlayStation anyways in the future. And you have the backlog of everything. You have all the advantages of being on PC in general. But I still think a PS5 Pro is going to sell quite well. There's a lot of people out there that think that they need the newest and greatest thing, but you really don't.
And the PS5 Pro is a huge wake up call, at least that we're seeing in the community of how do you sell a console when there isn't games to show it running well? Like say companies like this with the Wii U, Nintendo, because when they launched that console, it just launched with no games that were specifically made for it. Over time, they built up games and built up a really nice library for the Wii U, but because it didn't launch with new and interesting games for the Wii U itself, the Wii U failed. We even seen this with the Xbox series consoles. I mean, that console generation is really not doing that well. It's because there's been no interest in games launched on Xbox in such a long time. I mean, Starfield, I'm gonna buy a new console for Forza. The PS5 Pro is a huge wake up call, just showing us like how much games matter. And that graphics and performance, other than frame rate that affects how the game feels, it doesn't really matter as much is these companies want to make us think. And we've seen a clear response in the community is just like, you're looking at these side-by-sides of the PS5 Pro improvements and people just don't really care about them. And I can feel kind of bad for the PS5 Pro, like the hardware developers and the, the marketing team that had to market this console. Everything's been slowing down. And then when they go to their studios and everything, the developers and the games that they've been releasing are just not that exciting. And you get this, this console that just, is really lame and kind of falls flat when it actually comes out. That's the PS5 Pro. It's a wake up call of how much games really matter and actually how this price can just kind of push people to go to PC. What do I know? I just have a great PC that I love and I will probably never buy a console again. Also, you probably noticed my shirt, fit check. I've got the thing and then you look on the back. It's got the spine on it. And Gamers Nexus, I'm just looking at you right now if you actually happen to be watching this video. I have to do a review on your shirt for you because I ordered this back in May and it just showed up because it was like, it was a limited launch, so it took a while to get here. I actually like it quite a bit. I think it, I think the fit is good. It's a full cotton t-shirt and it feels a little like thick, I guess you could call it. I think the foil looks nice and everything It's nice and shiny. I actually like the shirt quite a bit. It's a little expensive, but it was limited run. It's YouTuber merch, so it doesn't really surprise me. That's been it for me. Um, and I'm gonna see you guys in the next video. Let me know what you think about the PS5 Pro. All right, see ya, peace. Mm -hmm.